As a full-time global nomad, I'm always on the go, moving from city to city, country to country. And to be clear, this lifestyle can be really exciting and liberating, but it can also be challenging, especially when it comes to finding housing. So today I wanna to talk about six options for digital nomads and global nomads, the pros and cons of each. And since I've stayed in each of these types of accommodations, Stick with me to the end to find out which one I think is best, and I'll also give you some helpful criteria to determine which one is best for you. We're gonna talk about Airbnbs, hostels, house sitting, couch surfing and or staying with friends, the work away program, and of course, short-term uh, leases on rental houses or apartments. So let's start with Airbnb. You know that Airbnb is a web-based marketplace that connects people who need a place to stay with people who have extra space to rent out. Sometimes you can rent out an entire place. Sometimes you can rent out just a room. The choice is yours. Airbnb really does allow for a variety of accommodations, including apartments, housing, rooms, as I mentioned, um, huts, yurts, <laughs> anything you can think of as far as accommodation, tents, Airbnb has it. The pro here is that Airbnb is in almost every city in the world. I think it's a good option for digital nomads because it does offer a wide variety of choices um, and flexibility, honestly. So some of the pros for Airbnb is that you can find affordable-ish accommodation in almost any city in the world. Um, it's going to be, you're going to pay a premium compared to what somebody who lives in that area would pay. Um, and so if you don't know where else to look, you can absolutely look to Airbnb and you'll probably find something. Another pro here is that Airbnb now is a pretty well-established company. And so you can look at the reviews of the houses that, or the the rental places that are on the site and get a pretty good idea of what to expect. Although I have been tricked a few times by pictures because people take those wide angle lens <laughs> uh, photos and I think, oh, that place is big. And then you get there and it's literally a water closet. Yeah. So just be careful with that. Um, a con though with Airbnb is that because you're staying at someone else's home, you know, there's less privacy as than you would have in your own apartment. It's not really set up. Airbnb, another con, is not set up for long-term uh, stays. So for me, as a global nomad, um, a global digital nomad, I'm not bopping from one place to the next every week. So Airbnb is good for a week or two. I tend to stay in a place for... Um, at least a month, but usually like one to six months. And so if you're gonna stay someplace for six months or longer, you wanna find something more permanent than Airbnb. Hostels are another good option, especially when you first arrive in a city. Now I know in the United States, we might turn our nose up at staying in a hostel. We might've seen that movie, Hostel, and got kind of scared away. But in the rest of the world, um, that's, what people do actually they stay in hostels and there are some really nice hostels around the world typically hostels are considered a type of budget accommodation where guests share a room with other guests it's kind of dormitory style but you can also get a private room at a hostel they often have communal areas like kitchens and kind of sitting areas for guests to use and co-work space free wi-fi hey <laughs> um and they often organize activities that you can choose to participate in while you stay there. Um, they're often seen as a good option for younger people, although I am in my mid to late 30s. I stay in hostels uh, and I have met many people in their 40s, 50s, 60s in hostels and having a grand old time. Uh, some of the pros of a hostel are that hostels are actually really, really affordable. I've stayed in hostels for as cheap as $7 a night and it was a nice hostel, okay? I'm talking about like six minute walk to the beach, um, clean bathrooms, quiet environment, strong Wi-Fi. This was in Brazil. Um, so really, I mean, there are good 
I, I, hostels are a great affordable option. Um, and they're a really great way to meet other travelers, right? So I think that's a huge pro in the side of hostels because I'm often traveling by myself. And as a solo female traveler, as a single black woman traveling these streets, it's important to have opportunities where I can meet and connect with other people along the journey. Now, one of the pros of staying, or the cons of staying in a hostel is that depending on which one you book, it can be loud <laughs> and you may not have a private bathroom. You might have to share a bathroom. Um, so sometimes you might be in a dorm as small as like four people in a room, four people sharing a single bathroom, or you might be in one like I was in, in Porto, Portugal, where there were 14 people and we shared, well, there were four bathrooms. So 14 people and we shared four bathrooms. Um, oh, that, that hostel was so nice. <laughs> it was the Sandman, Sandman, Sandman. It's where they make the, the port wine for this brand, Sandman. And the winery had a hostel and I was like, I'm here for it. Uh, anyway, hostels are another good option, but there are some cons. If you really, really, really need um, a lot of privacy, uh, hostels might not be the best option for you. Now, house sitting is definitely one of my favorites, and I'll link, leave a link down in the description or the first comment um, so that you can sign up for Trusted House Sitters, which is the app that I use in order to find house sits around the world. House sitting is a great way to live rent free while you're abroad. Basically, when people who own a home or maybe they rent a place, when they go away and travel, they want their home to look lived in or sometimes they have pets. Maybe they have a cat or a couple of dogs, some fish that they need fed and they don't want to kennel the dog or whatever they will invite a house sitter to come and stay in the house and basically look after the pets and live there for free. You don't get paid to be a house sitter, although you can, not through trusted house sitters, but through other avenues. But you do get free accommodation. Oftentimes, you can eat their food. Uh, sometimes they will leave their car for you. So if you don't have a car if, and it's in a remote area, they might leave their car for you to use. So. Um, trusted house sitters is my favorite. There's other ones out there like mind my house. Um, you know, word of mouth is also really good, but a couple of pros for me, it's a very low cost option. Often you get to stay in houses that are a lot more, um, comfortable and higher standard than a hostel or even an Airbnb, um, sometimes because, um, especially with trusted house sitters, there's a fee to be on that app. And so the homeowners who are on the app are usually people with higher quality accommodation um, versus like another app like Mind My House. I, the fee is like $7 a year or something really, really cheap. And so you can see the quality of housing available differs. Um, but there are lots of options. I think house sitting is a great option, <laughs> but there are some cons as well. I mean, house sitting has its challenges. I just made a video about the cat who keeps bringing me dead birds. Three days in a row, this cat brought me a dead bird. And the homeowner was like, oh, that means the cat loves you. And I know technically that is what that means. And I know that um, it's normal cat behavior, but it still creeps me out every single time it happens. And so uh, there are just some things that you need to be aware of <laughs> with house sitting. Another thing, for instance, I'm traveling uh, in Europe. And so I can only have a 90 day visa in this country. You should be aware that if you are a global nomad, make sure that you um, have the proper visa in order to stay in the house, in the location where you're house sitting. Okay, moving on from there, couch surfing. Now there's a company called couch surfing, but also the concept of couch surfing or staying with friends um, is in my opinion, a really great way to go. A lot of times your network is a lot larger than you 
even know. So if you just reach out to people in your, you know, your friends and your family and you tell them, hey, I'm going to Thailand. Hey, I'm going to Portugal. Then they may say, oh, I used to work with somebody who has a sister in uh, Belize, right? Maybe I'm going to Belize. Oh, I, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody in Belize. They're good people. You should reach out to them. So then you get connected to this person. Now you have a friendly face in that location, potentially someone to stay with for a little while while you're there. Even if you don't end up staying with that person, I think it's always a good idea to pulse your network and to see who knows who and maybe you can make connections in the place where you're going. I know that in my years of traveling, I've met lots of people and I've ended up staying with complete strangers. The very first time that I went to Colombia, I stayed with my cousin's co-worker. They have been co-workers for two weeks. My cousin's co-workers sister. So my cousin, in, I was living in California, my cousin in Chicago, his coworker that he had just met after two weeks had a sister. They were Colombian. She lived in Bogota and we went and stayed with her and her husband in Bogota. And it was the best <laughs> experience that I could have hoped for. I mean, they showed us all around. We cooked together and we were all similar age groups. So we just, we went out together. We had a good time. And that is what um, pulsing your network and couch surfing can do for you. A few years after that, they had a friend who was traveling in the States and he came and stayed with me for two weeks um, while he visited the States. And then I drove him, he came to Northern California and, I, and then I drove him to San Francisco so that he could hang out and sp stay a couple weeks with some other people. So we didn't know each other all that well. None of us did. <laughs> but this is the bond that you build with people when you are traveling and the one of the pros, in my opinion, of couch surfing. Now the con here, honey, there is a con, okay? It may not be as comfortable or as clean as your standards um, because everybody has their own different standards. So you do have to kind of be aware that that's a possibility. They could be really, really clean or they, it could be a really, really comfortable place, but you just, you don't know. Um, and also it requires being really respectful of that person's space because this is not a stranger that you are staying with now. This is now a person who is part of your network. And so the way that you behave, um, you have to behave like a friend <laughs> because you have to behave as if this relationship is going to continue. Because even if you never talk to that person again, the reputation that you or the impression that you leave follows you you. They, they're going to report back. Like if I had went to Bogota and acted a John Brown fool, then my cousin's coworker's sister would have told her sister and it would have got back to my cousin, right? It's just not a good idea. So one of the cons is that um, it, it, it could be a pro or a con, but you have to, you know, you want to be on your best behavior. <laughs> okay, the Workaway program. Workaway is a program that connects travelers with hosts who need help with some kind of project or work for a short period of time. You can go to Workaway, it's a website, and they have a whole bunch of opportunities listed. And what you do, a lot of times it's like, I need help painting my barn or um, I need help learning English. Can you come and stay with us for uh, three months and spend an hour a day talking with us in English so that we can practice, right? Or there's just a variety of opportunities, but it really, it is um, work. Some of the opportunities are paid, some of them are not but it always involves housing. Um, I think Workaway is a great way to immerse yourself in the local culture and save a little bit of money on your trip. Uh, it's also a great way to really meet new people and to make new connections and to learn new skills, right? Uh, so if you wanna learn sheep herding, 
there's a place for that. If you want to learn about calligraphy, you can go and be an apprentice calligrapher and have free housing um, while you work in this calligraphy studio. And oftentimes it's not like an eight hour workday. It's like one to three hours a day. And then you have the rest of your time free to do whatever else you want. Um, and it's a really great way to see how other people around the world live. I think one of the best things about travel is that it exposes you to the fact that the way you were raised or where you were born is not the only way to live. Work away is a great opportunity for housing and a great way to expose yourself to other cultures. Now the con with work away is that you are working, okay? And depending on which opportunity you choose, you might be doing manual labor, you might not like it, you might not, I mean, there's just, there's, there's some cons associated. A lot of times the housing is not as um, upscale or um, it's not maybe what you would choose for yourself, especially if you're going to a less wealthy nation or if you're going to a very rural place and you're not familiar with living in a rural environment, it can be kind of a shock for you. So just when you're on the WorkAway site, do your research and understand um, what type of opportunity you're getting yourself into. Now, finally, short-term leases on rental houses and apartments. For me, this is the option that I prefer second to house sitting. House sitting is my number one choice, to be honest. Um, but second to house sitting, I do like a short-term uh, rental. So like a six month, uh, I try to get a month to month lease if I can. And I've been very fortunate that even in places like in Mexico where they want um, a guarantor basically like a co-signer, or they want you to have a six month or a year lease, or sometimes they want you to pay up front. Even in those places, I've been very blessed and fortunate to find um, people that were willing to rent to me on a month to month basis, no upfront deposit, just like really good experiences. A lot of that has come through pulsing my network and also like just walking around in the streets and calling the numbers where it says, you know, for rent. Um, but there's lots of Facebook marketplace or Facebook uh, groups where people are um, advertising that they have space available to rent. And that's oftentimes how nomads, especially global nomads, find short-term leases on rental houses or apartments. Now, the pro of this for me is that you have a stable structure. You're not working. You have a lot more privacy. You can choose um, your location. So you can choose a more desirable area instead of being at the mercy of wherever your friend's friend lives or being at the mercy of wherever this work away thing is. Um, and also there's more privacy. So there's a lot of a, a lot of pros associated with short-term rental. But there are some cons that you need to be aware of, especially in various parts of the world. Once you are renting, anything that goes wrong in that place is your responsibility to take care of. So if the refrigerator breaks while you're living there, the landlord's like, Okay, so deal with it, fix it. And sometimes it's not even anything as big as that, but um, a a a it depends on where you are. But a lot of times, like once you live there, it is your responsibility until you leave, right? So be aware of that. And also rules and laws and just kind of that contract what is the responsibility of the landlord versus what is your responsibility can be very different than what you're used to if you're coming from the United States, for example. So just plan ahead, um, do your research, and maybe talk to someone uh, who has lived, it, you know, an expat or a nomad who has lived in that area for a while so that you know what questions to ask before you sign a lease or before you move into a short-term rental place. So how do you choose the best option for you when looking for housing as a digital nomad? Of course, there are a few things that you have to consider, like what's your budget? What kind of amenities do you need? What kind of location do you want? And how long do you plan to stay in a place? But another thing that I think is really important is to look at what I call the components of place. 
okay? So there is the physical location. Where is this place geographically? Um, and then there are the activities that take place, activities and amenities that happen there. And then there's like the meaning associated with it. All three of those things are very important when you're considering where to live. And so physical geographic location, for me, that's things like, am I a city person or a rural person, right? Um, what, which city, <laughs> which location, um, where in that city? Am I going to be in the center of town or I'm going to be kind of on the outskirts of town? Is it walkable? All those physical things are important. Then the amenities and services. Amenities kind of like, is it the walkability is important? Is there good public transportation? How strong is the Wi-Fi? Does the Wi-Fi go out when it rains? Um, you know, is there, is this on a, a, a loud parade route that happens every Thursday? Different things like that. You know, are, is there a grocery store nearby? Uh, all those kinds of things, like what are the services and amenities? And then the third component is meaning. When you choose a place to live, you do need to, especially if you're not from the area, you need to consider what does it mean for you to live there. Once you've considered all these factors, then you can start narrowing down your your options. And honestly, if money is no option, then you have a lot more freedom in choosing where to stay. But if you're like me, where you're not a budget traveler, but you do have a budget, <laughs> so you're not looking for the cheapest thing out there, but you need to live within your means, then you'll need to be a little bit more selective. And in my opinion, hands down, the best option is house sitting especially because there are so many options all over the world um, and you can be really selective about the physical location, the amenities and services happening in that location and the meaning, what does it mean for me to live and be in that place? Um, so yeah, you know, basically final thoughts when choosing housing as a digital nomad, there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, you definitely want to take into account your budget, location preferences, desired amenities, all that stuff. But most importantly, I think that you should be flexible when considering which type of housing to choose. And you should think about what suits your needs most. Maybe you're in a mode where you want to have an, an, an adventure and then work away or a hostel might be a better option for you rather than a short-term rental. Maybe you're in a mode where you are looking to not be a nomad anymore, but you actually want to immigrate to that place. Then you might want to find a um, specific a short-term rental so you can see what is it like to actually rent there. No matter what your budget or needs are, there's really an option out there that will work for you. And the most important thing is to do your research ahead of time so that you know what to expect. You know me, guys. I want us to go where we feel most alive and to only have positive surprises when we get there. That's what this channel is about, is preparing you for a life as a digital nomad or an expat. If you're interested in more content about how to go where you feel most alive, watch this video and subscribe. Thank you.